Okay, welcome to the 91st episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today I'm really delighted, and I mean delighted, to be speaking to Dr. William Verling. Uh, Dr. Verling is a consultant paediatrician who has worked as a doctor for over 20 years. He is the creator of a new app to improve patient experience, the co-founder of Parent Med, a training resource for new parents, and the lead of Chilled Dorset, a not-for-profit organization that uses cold water therapy to help people with anxiety and depression. Hello, Williams. Hello, Piers. Lovely to be here. Yeah. So one of the, the segues I always do with my podcast is how I met uh, the different people or came across their work. So I, I first came across your your work was probably 1986. You were 11. Yeah. And I was in the cubicle um, just along from yours. Yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> I remember that very clearly. My yeah. first day, um, I got dropped off. I'm sure we'll get into this as we go into the podcast. But my first day, I got dropped off by my parents. And one of my first challenges was, um, and it was around the time I remember meeting you, as you say, I think your mum and dad that were there and possibly your sister as well had come up. And I couldn't do the um, buttons up on my britches. Um, and so um, I was walking around with a sort of my fly open most of the day, uh, most of that day. And I remember that caused me a lot of uh, anxiety and stress, um, uh, particularly given some of the things that I'd been warned about. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was that was my memory of my first day um, and going to get our coats, and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then watching, you know, watching everyone's parents leave, really. And then there we were um, in that 30 bed dormitory. It was pretty cold. You can smell the floor polish. Uh, trying to find, you know, just find our way around, really. Um, as you say, yeah, September 1986. It's uh, quite um, a long time ago now. <laughs> that, it's nearly 40 years, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but we were there. So, yeah, so. Me and Will, we were uh, at boarding school for seven years, so from 1986 through till 1993. And, yeah, it was, for me, a very challenging time. Um, and today I'd love for us to get into a little bit, especially from your perspective of being a paediatrician, you know, just, you know, knowing what you know now, but I'd love before we get into that, what got you into the work of being a paediatrician and working with children? Well, there's I suppose there's there's sort of a few answers to this. Um, I do have a bit of a family background of, of medicine, my uncle and my grandfather, and so that you often that's quite common to see that kind of like nudging in that direction. Although it worked in the opposite direction for me because I, the school we went to, which I think we can name, we, we've talked about this. There is a school in Southern England, a charity school called Christ Hospital. Um, it's around Horsham. So the school I went to, um, uh, the A-levels I did were quite different, actually. Um, so I did English archaeology and uh, geography, which were very, very, that won't get you into medical school. Um, and I was going to do something completely different. Um but one of the things that kind of, I think, pushed me into medicine a bit was I left Christ Hospital with an overwhelming sense of having failed, actually. Um, and I felt quite stung by some of the sort of, I think, some of the comments I'd, I'd had. Um, and, you know, I hadn't done terribly there, but I, I definitely felt like I'd let people down somehow or I hadn't done enough or I wasn't enough. And actually, there have been lots of sort of comments of you're not going to amount to very much. Um, and uh, I remember one of the teachers who I believe has you know, been involved in some of the recent um, scandal around the school. Um, I mean, I remember some comments from him you know, along the lines of you don't deserve your place in this great school. Uh, I doubt you'll ever get into university. So there were lots of that sort of stuff in the background when I left, um, and that was sort of scattered across various reports. Um, and I, I I got to the point where I just felt angry, really angry about that. And um, I had got a place to go off and do I think, land management somewhere. Um, but I felt like I got a point to prove. 
Uh, and so I thought, right, what's the hardest thing to do? What's one of the hardest things to get into? And obviously there's a number of things. The medicine would be one of the hard things to get into, I guess, certainly was then. And I thought, right, I'm going to go and do that. Um, and I'm going to prove people, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to prove people wrong. It's quite an immature response, really. I mean, I was 18, 19, um, and that's probably not the, um, not the, yeah, not the most mature response in, uh, in terms of uh, how to plan your life. And it wasn't just that, you know, I think, you know, you start thinking a bit more what's instilled into you is about, you know, I've got to get a good job and I've got to earn money and uh, I've got to do something responsible and something that will represent the school. There was a lot of stuff about, you know, we're, we're ambassadors for the school. So, um, and then there was the family stuff as well, but that was very much in the background, to be honest. It, it, a big thing is that I wanted to prove myself. Um, so I went off and I did, you know, did some things to get into the medicine, did a sabbatical course, or, or did A-levels in a sort of fairly short period of time, got into medical school, and felt immediately very comfortable. Um, I went to one of the traditional London medical schools, and uh, this was back in the mid 90s and lots of real familiarity there in terms of what I was used to. But with the added benefit that relatively you were quite free, you weren't you weren't captive there at all as, as it felt like we were. Um, so you had all of these quite reassuring structures, hierarchies, traditions, um, and there felt like there was a big carryover. And of course, there were quite a few people from boarding school um, who, who were there. So it felt a familiar environment, but again, um, not completely comfortable, I guess, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, I think some of my coping mechanisms at school had been a, a, a bit around being a bit of a joker, a bit of a clown, you know, wrong place, wrong time, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I, I guess I'd slightly played up to that. Um, and, and I could sort of feel that coming out a little bit at, at medical school just you know yeah perhaps pushing still pushing against something which i probably didn't need to push against at that point anyway fast forward uh, a little way and um and i never really thought i was going to qualify i just wanted to just prove i could do it mm-hmm. um and it took me about three years before i felt authentic there um I, every year came up to the exams and i thought i'm just going to get found out i'm going to get hauled out this is something so I've opened a door that I didn't have the right to have the key to sort of thing. Um, so it took me a long time to felt like I, I, I sort of genuinely belonged there. There were, as I say, there were reassuring things, but it, you know, in terms of the, the structure and the feel of it. Um, and then you start work and your life changes massively. You know, there's the reality of working on the wards. And actually that was one of the most therapeutic things I, I think I'd been through. Um, and I think just the, there wasn't really time to particularly mull over things. You just had to get on with the practicalities of being a junior doctor. And that gave me a real welcome break from, I suppose, my own inner ongoing, I suppose, mental turmoil, never feeling settled, never being able to relax. Lots of things that were a bit of a carryover from my hospital and boarding school. Mm-hmm. Um and and then I just fell down a path, as many people do. Uh, some people have aspirations. They know what they want to do. But I was influenced by various people. Oh, this is a good career. I was going to do A&E. And then someone in A&E said, oh, you ought to do some pediatrics because actually that's good experience. And, I, you know, I've done some work in Australia as well and out in the outback. And I wanted to do pre-hospital care, essentially. But I, I ended up going down in the route of pediatrics, which, which I, you know, which has turned out pretty well. I love it. It's a great specialty. It's kind of, and it has its moments of real seriousness and difficulty, but uh, lots of fun. You know, it's a nice sort of cohort to deal with. Children generally get poorly uh, quickly, but get better quickly, and you know, usually turn them around, and you know, they can be on their way, and and actually have got it all in their mind. So, um, yeah, that that was that was how I, I ended up um, in in pediatrics, and um, you know, ten years working as a consultant now it's yeah it's it's still you know it's, it's tough in the nhs at times but yeah i enjoy it but it was um yeah it wasn't the most conventional routine i guess no I remember actually, as you speak I have so many memories i have um i went to australia for a year gap year and i kind of left and when you i came back you were like right i'm going to do medicine and i'm like 
<laughs> you were about to go to geography or land management at uni and i was like wow and you'd start to do your a levels uh you know and yeah, yeah it was interesting it was part of i think i think there was a bit of a reinvention that was going on as well and i remember like I, I i really had something to prove that i came away from that school feeling quite empty really and um I couldn't quite make sense of it. One of the things I did was change my name, um, which I think a few of us have done. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, not a massive thing. I mean, we all had nicknames at school. Uh, kids kids at school, particularly kids with a lot of time on their hands, can be very creative and uh, have got all, all sorts of wonderful ways of coming up with nicknames. And one of my early nicknames was uh, Radio Operator. I think it's less of an issue now, but when I was younger, I spoke very much with a nasal voice. So I used to get called uh, Verling, calling Verling, which I think is quite funny, actually. It was quite a good nickname. And then that evolved into, uh, I think it was Big Vern and Vern, I think because I was reasonably tall, utterly it ridiculous. like that, that character from Viz. Oh, from Viz, but it was completely <laughs> ridiculous because I'm about the most you know pacifist person you would meet but yeah he sort of used to go around shooting people i think didn't he cool. um so but anyway that's what i was called Vern. and so when i left there I, I just wanted a complete fresh start so i when i went to do the sort of um these two extra a levels at a local city college i just you know it's, it's called will i just thought oh, my name's will and and there was a bit of a process around sort of reinventing it really and, and feeling mm -hmm. like you need to do that um but yeah no i um I remember you similarly i think you 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 went through a bit of a name change didn't you yeah i changed my name i was peers when i got to school yeah I think within two weeks i changed it to simon and then it became zig and then it became ziggy and then yeah. most of the time i was known as ziggy and then as soon as i left school i think within a week i'd turned it back to peers uh, yeah it's just wow such a, a strange thing and yeah i've heard you know boris johnson he was called alexander then alex and he became boris he's never left his persona no no and i think we we, we were talking about this um previously just what's extraordinary is that we went through um so we started at age 10 or 11 and we went through this experience together through um a junior boarding house and then into a senior boarding house um and we left at 18. We were there for seven years and we were in the company of um, 60 odd boys in our boarding house, maybe a few more, 60 or 70. And there would have been 12 or so in our year um, in the boarding house. And I can still to this day recite the roll call like without a problem. I can't remember three things of shopping that I need. My wife needs me to get, but I can remember the roll call. Um, and um, for many of us, we walked away from that place and never saw those people again. And I, I think that's extraordinary. I mean, for, for the intensity that you have right up to that moment and all of the pageantry we had when we left school remember we had the beating of the retreat where we had a hundred piece band march through this huge quadrangle um uh, all of the parents every you know well every that's right time. yeah yeah it took me a long time to be able to eat lunch without the sound of the hundred piece marching band <laughs> uh, yeah I, I mean great preparation for real life but uh yeah so, you know, we'd gone through all of that and then and then just scattered is what it felt like. People really just scattered out and across the globe. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, it didn't seem to be lots of people coming back into that um, really um, at any time. I think, you know, that's sort of quite unusual, really. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So I'd love for you, Will, to share a little bit about, you know, the work you now do and looking because you, you take do safeguarding, pastoral care. Love you to link that into boarding school. Looking back at our experience for the seven years, was there safeguarding at our school? Was there pastoral care in the how you know know it now? Yeah, so I think it's probably worth just putting a bit of context in, really. So, I mean, our school was an unusual school in that obviously the, it was a charitable school, and the aim was to provide. Um, a public school boarding education for children, some of whom were, were came from less privileged backgrounds, came from uh, traumatic backgrounds, um, and and showed sort of promise. And that was the kind of that was the premise. And I, I can never remember what the um, the sort of percentage split were, but there was a significant number who were that was the aim really to bring them in. And 
that is an exceedingly laudable aim. You can't, you know, you can't dispute that. That 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 as a simple aim is is that's that's fantastic. I've no doubt, you know, that will have been beneficial for some people. But I think if you you can see where problems are going to arise if you bring that a group of people like that who may be bringing more trauma than one would expect from that cohort into an environment where unless, unless you've got really robust pastoral care, wraparound pastoral care, and pastoral care is different from safeguarding, there are sort of overlaps, but unless you've got that and of course safeguarding, then you're you're likely to run into problems. And I think that's one of the, you know, if you put aside all of the kind of issues around boarding school and boarding school syndrome, which I'm sure we'll talk about in its own separate things, I think there are problems with that. And my experience in terms of the pastoral care was um, there was very little, really. Um, I think back to our our boarding house and, of course, um, a maternal feminine in influence isn't essential but I think it's pretty important. And I think from the moment that we arrived there, that was absent. I would say completely absent. And I was a really soft kid. When I got when I came to school, I'd only just turned 11. I came from a really quiet, you know, little sleepy place. Um, I had a really close relationship with my, you know, my mum and my dad. And um, yeah, and, and I remember that being one of the most striking things that you go there. And there was no no female influence at all. So we had a housemaster who I I do have real admiration for, and I have I've got fond memories for. Well, I think he was a good man, and he was trying to do the right thing. I think he was perhaps misguided in some of the things he did, and I think he, in his own way, didn't have the emotional language to be able to 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 fill that. But I think he he tried, but I don't think he he had that ability. Um, and the only, I suppose, the only sort of maternal, female, feminine influence was was really arguably our matron, who was significantly older, you know, and I don't, and there was nothing there at all. Mm. So there felt, the, the fundamentals didn't feel like they were there in terms of pastoral care, caring for, you know, what is essentially still a very young child. You know, if we think about childhood in stages and we now acknowledge that even adolescence probably extends to, you know, 24, 25, you know, 11 is, is, is really still quite young. So that didn't feel like it existed to me. And I mean, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, in the context of this and where, where that sort of care would sit, I mean, we weren't even meeting some of our basic needs. I remember feeling freezing cold, um a lot of the time we weren't allowed duvets we slept on horsehair mattresses um and um for uh, uh yeah for a while iron beds horsehair mattresses and if you the person who'd been in the mattress the year before you was significantly heavier than you you'd spend the first time trying to sort of wriggle out their kind of indentation of the mattress so it just wasn't comfortable um it was the dorms were often cold windows were stuck heating was pretty variable um you didn't feel at any time safe um i certainly didn't i felt on a heightened i felt in fear i realized that only you know a few years ago i was, like, I was in fear all the time yeah i think that's i think i would absolutely agree with that and what's difficult as a 10 11 year old boy is that you can sometimes miss miss assess that as a sort of because i remember feeling a bit it was a bit exciting but I also was scared. And of course, they're, they're on a bit of a continuum. Um, and so I, I remember, am I feeling, is this all very exciting or is it all just terrifying? But, you know, I think I was misassessing what was actually, a lot of this was pretty terrifying because you, so you were cold, uh, you were uncomfortable, um, you've got no maternal feminine care, as it were, or female aspect of care. Uh, you didn't have contact with your, your parents. I think we had a single phone the whole house um and very it. much a hierarchy on that so you could be on the phone to your dad and then some kid would come along and tell your dad where to go uh am i allowed to swear on here you can yeah of course <laughs> yeah you know tell your dad to fuck off and your mum to do this or whatever um so you didn't have that and then you, if, if we then take it onto the dining hall going to the dining hall beautiful building this amazing mm -hmm. uh 
one of the longest pictures in the country, if not the world. Uh, this gorgeous painting. We went back there recently, and it's a stunning piece of architecture, as is the whole school. I mean, it's this sort of proper, you know, Oxford dreaming, dreaming spires kind of feel to it. Um, but actually, on an October, cold October 1986, you know, autumn, winter, felt pretty austere, well, really austere. And so I, I never felt guaranteed of any food. And I don't, I don't think I'm kind of exaggerating this. I've got really vivid memories of you'd see the food style at the top of the table. And people would, you know, the, the people more senior would ladle on a load of food and then you'd be scrapping around for whatever's at the, you know, and you'd get, just go for a long periods of time where there wasn't really a lot of food. I remember there being lots of milk and lots of toast. And I remember living on that. Um, and, you know, that that being a thing. So, again, you, you know, you don't have those sort of key, you know, they're, they're really basic, you know, really far down on that pyramid, aren't they, in terms of the things you've got to build on. Um and then any sense of love, well, there was there wasn't any. I mean, there there was there was nothing at all really. Um, I think there was there was a degree of care, as I say. We mentioned the headma- um, the housemaster, um, but I didn't really I didn't really feel anything beyond that. Um, so I don't think it was there, and I certainly don't think it was there to capture the and and help with the sort of some of the really complex. Uh, issues that some of the children were dealing with um and that you know that was really obvious from really early on and those children were often left to the boys to deal with um you know there was there was one child and i'm not sure what his background was but he had he was really struggling with starting at Portland school and i think he got i think his i think his father was much older and was poorly and i could relate to that because one of the reasons i went to Christ's hospital i was told is well if your father dies Mm -hmm. then the school will be there to pick things up so there was quite a lot of emotional investment for me being there Mm -hmm. um and i think there was something with him i think he got some some issue and so he definitely got some attachment issues he got a very uh unusual um attachment to a particular teddy bear and that was his link to home and he was really, I remember him just struggling horrendously for the first, well, quite a significant time in probably the first few years. Yeah. But very early on in life, someone recognized the importance of what this um, teddy bear was to him. This is his link. And I mean, we, I think we all had teddy bears that most of us sort of were, learned. You just shove them out the way mm-hmm. early on. Mine was a rugby ball. I used it as, you know, or... Oh. I've heard different people talk about the teddy bears, um, but yeah. But he, this, this was clearly really important to him. And I think as a moment of trauma, I, I, I just feel so sorry for this guy because I remember watching it happen. And one of the older kids um, hid under his bed with a knife. And um, not just, uh, I think it was, it was a big knife. It was <laughs> hunting. And um, and I think one of the things is this, I think this child thought that the, the, the teddy bear could talk and had got some link with home and what have you. And this kid got the knife and basically said, oh, don't worry, I'll show you, you know, I'll just, you know, just reassure you, it's just a normal teddy bear. And he literally disemboweled it. And I'm sure for that child, that would have felt as real as, you know, if that had been, you know, a real, someone real to him um and it was just incredibly traumatic to watch and so you watch these kind of people we we had people with real anger issues who could have really done with some sort of structured you know help um and they were they were just they were just objects kind of fun really that people would just um think right we're bored let's let's go and wind so and so up and then Um, if they they got angry it was psycho 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 shouting at them like... yeah so i i think you know I, there there was a real gap there undoubtedly um and then i mean safeguarding I, i'm also just slightly i think we have to be a bit wary but it's very difficult contrasting eras we see this mm. for lots of things because you know we learn lessons we evolve as as, as humans we learn lessons that said, of course, there are some basic tenets that should always be present. You know, the desire to safeguard and look after a child and, and give them a, a safe environment to, to thrive in. But 
so with the with the caveat that you have to be a little bit careful comparing eras i i do think if we take safeguarding to be um protecting a child from harm mm. um then i i think undoubtedly the school failed mm. Mm. we know that from the recent court cases i think we have as the last count i think there were six of the teachers from our era who have been jailed um for you know some very very serious offenses mm. and i think i don't think it's contentious to say that you know say that there was a culture of abuse in that school i don't mm. think you can say anything else if there were that number of teachers and so again i have to be a little careful about what i say and not get to uh kind of emotionally uh responsive to this but of course i have real anger towards some of those individuals some of them who i knew first you know i knew well uh ironically and i'm sure we'll get into what was a seminal event for us which was the suicide of one of the boys in our house mm -hmm. um but one of them was meant to be providing me with pastoral care and actually um that was um essentially that he used that as an opportunity to try um you know essentially to try and abuse me um, mm -hmm. is what it was mm -hmm. and i think that's something that a few people have, have commented on and he's you know he's, again that's fairly widely reported mm -hmm. um as as sort of a bit of a modus operandi really so which is it's incredible isn't it that someone's at their weakest and lowest i, I mean when i share my story you know of that you know, it was after Rick died and we the school sent us to the uh, this person, to this teacher. And yep. when I, I told you about it, I think I remember or you said to me in our mid 20s what had happened. The other said that happened exactly the same thing happened to me. And I, I just wonder how many others it happened to. And that was one of the things I think at boarding schools and um, is you don't speak up. I mean, you don't grasp. I think yeah. I learned that very early on was you don't speak up, even if something terrible's happened. Yeah. But what happens then is, you know, as, as happened with us, is like, you know, things were not spoken okay. about and bad things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that was, you know, we, I, 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 I knew we would we would talk about this because it was such a pivotal moment. And I mean, we can fit it in. You know, we can talk about it here, really. I mean, I, I suppose just yeah, for context, this was um, I'm sure you have talked about it, but this was a well, first things is uh, Piers and I, we well, we both went up to the senior house early, didn't we? So we thought that was the cool thing to do. So at the age of 14, I think it was, you could split half of you stayed down in the junior house and you could kind of be senior there. So you were the you were the top of the smallish bond i suppose or you could move up and be the most junior people in the senior house and that was kind of perceived to be the cool thing you had a bit more you knew you were going to get some grief because you were the you were the youngest there uh in that house but you probably had a bit more freedom and opportunity and, um so that's kind of the, the route we chose but it was quite a hard environment i think and our particular house um had i think a succession of house masters and i remember long periods of time where there wasn't really anyone there where there would be the housemaster would essentially just well there was one who was physically scared of i remember seeing him shoving and pushing people around and then um and then there was a housemaster who just wasn't there after a certain period of time so i think after seven o'clock at night he would just go and so you knew it was a bit of a free-for-all after that um and it really was at times um and and our house specifically got quite a reputation for um chaos which is what, what it felt. It felt pretty chaotic. Um, but now amongst that, there was one character, Rick, who I think seemed to be universally liked, um, liked by his peers, but also was just really fair and decent to the junior kids and and approachable, which again was perhaps less common. You know, you don't have many of the 18 year olds that you feel really approachable when you're 14. That's, that's, that's fair enough. Um, but he was, and and I think that's perhaps why, and we all were close, we all love Rick, we all were close to him. And I think that's why it felt so difficult. Um, and I remember the night before he died, he seemed absolutely fine. And, 
um, that took me a long time to work through that and to try and understand that, um, that he'd made peace with his decision that far ahead. Um, and I, as I said before, I wasn't perhaps the most, uh, didn't follow all the rules perhaps that I should do. I remember I was skipping a lesson and I remember hearing the train on the tracks screeching to a halt and then walking round um, and seeing a train on the tracks with an ambulance. I remember it was a very, very, very powerful memory. I'll never forget. Um, and I think from there, things just fell apart pretty quickly, really. I think really, really quickly. Um, we were told we were all ushered into um, the chapel. We were told by the chaplain. And then we were sent back to our houses. And I remember, again, there are just some memories you have which are really clear. And I remember, we, I remember obviously you being there and there were, I was standing, I think just standing against the wall, didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. The first time I've ever experienced anyone, I'd experienced suicide and it was so close. And his study was at the end of the day room on the right-hand side. And um, so he, there was this presence and he'd been very present the night before around the house. Um, he'd been asked, I think he was going out to the local town and he was been asking if anyone, want, if anyone wanted anything. Um, and people were sitting there just heads in their hands crying. I mean, I think it was an, and it was an extraordinary moment because we'd been at boarding school for five years and I'm not sure I'd, you know, apart from the first few years, uh, sorry, first few weeks we saw new boys cry. Generally, there wasn't anything like that. And there was this outpouring of emotion, which was extraordinary to be and completely understandable. And some of us were sitting around there numb. And I remember rather than being allowed to just deal with your emotion, and your grief, I remember people being marched out there, literally by some of the, I can't remember who, whether it's the senior boys there or whether it's the, the staff members, mm -hmm. and basically being forced to scrub the house. And I remember someone protesting about this, saying, I just want to sit here and cry. And this is on the day he died. Um, I remember one of the senior boys there saying, um, you know, fucking get on with it. I never liked him anyway on that day. So it was a really traumatic event. And then I think there was a real ghoulishness as well about what was happening. I think people were going down to the track and there were some horrible stories coming back. So as a 14-year-old, you know, dealing with that, with without your parents, with no one around, of course, you can't get hold of your parents, no mobile phones in those days. You can't get on the phone. Um, and then... You know, these sort of scrambled messages coming through, oh, your parents would like to speak to you. Well, I can't talk to them. You know, eventually this filter back to the parents. Um, and it was it was hugely impactful. I mean, just for me, I, I thought about Rick every day for 10 years. I, even when I remember even being in medical school, I just couldn't get out of my head. And I was terrified running. I remember the, the back stairs through the dormitories that you'd run past near where his bed was. And I was just so, I, I felt really scared running past there you know, after he died, you know, thinking, I don't know, his presence would be there or something. It, it felt really um, threatening and ominous, the whole house. So off the back of this, um, which was the single most traumatic event in my life at that point, and probably has been one of the most, I mean, I've seen some really, you know, in the career I've done, I've been involved in some incredibly traumatic events. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, uh, n you know, not many, but certainly some. And and this is, you know, this is unquestionably amongst, you know, those most traumatic of events. Um, um, there's nothing really that's going to supersede that, particularly at such a young age. And so we we were all bewildered at that point. And the school's response was obviously to send, you know, send us off for counselling. Now, that wasn't voluntary counselling. I remember being told, you're going to counselling. There was no sort of discussion about that. Um, and the first counselling session I had with, the chaplain um i was quite excited to go there um excited is the wrong word but i was kind of it was, i felt like it was going to be a bit of a relief not really that i wanted to talk about it much but i think because the house felt so austere it, even then you know well probably especially then we were the youngest in that house and you had no personal space so again just for a bit of color and context for your, your listeners peers i mean we had we were in 30 bed dormitories uh, really for the entirety of our career until we were A level students when we shared a study. I remember closing the door on that first day, and that's the first time I felt properly secure and I felt right. This is my space. 16. Um, 16. Five yeah. years. Five years, yeah. And so, um, so 
they were quite austere places as we, we've described them being you know often quite cold not much there no personal space there were no doors on the toilets mm -hmm. so you and know the baths or the showers no, all the baths and i remember just sitting wanting to have a bath and just being observed by you know a certain a certain master um and you just think oh, i can't even have a bath to myself so there was no privacy you had a, a, a bed a wardrobe and a, a, a what's called a settle which is a little kind of um what do you call it? It's almost like a little metal cake, box with metal a... box, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So there's nowhere. So the opportunity to go and talk to a master in a, a, a normal house, it's got carpet. You know, um, that that felt like that could be really nice. And it, you know, a fire, it was going to be warm. Um, there were some kids, off, obviously, who used to go to, I don't know, master's uh, studies or houses or whatever more often than certainly I did. Not, I'm not sort of saying there's anything sort of dodgy about that, but you'd get these stories of people coming back and they've had some, you know, um, I don't know, you know, had some nice food or house mastered. And, and that never really happened to me. So I, I, I actually was kind of looking forward to it just from that point of view. And no one was going to bother you as well. That's the other thing. So I went in and sat down. And then um, very rapidly, and I mean within a few, you know, after a few kind of moments of, pretty light introductory conversation um the teacher started asking uh, sorry the the chaplain started asking some very personal questions, you know really personal questions and it's difficult to talk about now because at the time you are that that aspect of your life is so uncertain you have so many questions yourself mm -hmm. and you feel like you're not valid as uh you know as a emerging adult you, you question your validity of that and then when someone shows some level of interest then your initial thought is oh well, that's quite cool that, that they can see that that's who i am you know so essentially what he was asking me about is which of the older girls i found attractive and why and it, and the and why bit that's where it all got you know the questions begun to be quite inappropriate um so you know i, I, I guess i got a bit of a wind into how these things can evolve really because if you take someone who is really really vulnerable in on so many levels and particularly at that moment and vulnerable in terms of your developmental stage and then someone shows some sort of validation of you um and i guess for me my it got to a point where the level of the level of um what's the word I suppose inappropriateness of the questions really rang alarm bells. And I said, I think I'm okay. Um, my, my dad, God rest his soul, had given me a little talk before I'd gone to the school about there might be some dodgy, you know, things that go on. <laughs> um, that's not right. You know, don't ever let that happen type thing. Um, which is why I felt so exposed on the first day where I couldn't even do my flies up. And I was like, Christ, I'm, I'm a sitting duck here. Um, so <laughs> um, I got, kind of got that ringing in my ears and I just thought, no, this is just so wrong. And so I remember walking away. And, and again, I can remember it to this day. Uh, as I walked away, these two hands on my shoulder just saying, no, 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 you need to stop. Um, you, you know, I've obviously upset you. You're really tense to come back. You need to come back for a massage. And I think what again what's extraordinary about that is how you and i shrugged him off you know you know i was 14 at the time and i you know i, I you know that was that was fine i shrugged him off came back and i think at the time my response was oh this is just for me a, a funny story for people you know you're so detached from your emotions and you are you're in this you're just trying to survive really particularly at that moment in time mm -hmm. that you I remember just coming back and I think I told someone and they just laughed and they were like, oh, dodgy so-and-so, uh, you know, and it wasn't, it didn't even feel like there'd be a forum that it would be taken seriously. Yeah, it, yeah, it just felt yeah. like there was, there was, there was nowhere. And for a long time, I didn't really think a lot about, about it. Mm -hmm. And it's only many years later that I, you know, I've tried to sort of, I suppose, evolve and think about myself and, you know what impacts various things in my life have had on me and and you know things that i'm you know my weaknesses and struggle with and one of them is is definitely a mistrust of authority 
Um, and it's a, it's a real deep, deep mistrust and pathological, I would say. Um, and, and I think it, clearly that's going to have had an impact at that moment in my life where, you know, you really are pretty desperate. Um, and you are definitely seeking help. This was such a seismic shock to the school. It was a seismic shock to the school and the local community. But the epicenter of that was our house, our boarding house. Um, no doubt, those 60 boys in our house. And there was something about the traumatic nature of it, um, the build-up to it, the aftermath, that all confounded those things. Mm. And at that moment when I really needed someone, and of course, we weren't allowed to go home. No. So it wasn't like anyone said, you, do you know what you what you know what you need now? We're going to arrange for your parents. You're going to have a day at home. You weren't allowed that. Mm -hmm. um, and at that moment, to have that happen and someone to take that that advantage, I think left has left a lot of you know left a lot of anger and and as I say, a huge mistrust of authority. And it, it you know even even within my career, you know I I do find it hard when you start working your way up the the sort of strata of any organisation um that you're you know i feel very comfortable with the people i work closely with and work on you know on the ground but i i found that i find that really hard and i guess that's just not surprising so mm. at a you know we've we've taken a very roundabout route here and you know and i can see it's visibly upsetting to you Piers, and i know it's, it's well, very very triggering for you well, it is but i think that's the powerful thing it's like because for me you know you mentioned about him saying come and have a massage and and i said yes so i went up to his bedroom mm. and i felt so revolted because he pressed his you know i won't go into the details but yeah. you know, essentially i never went back and i never told anyone and i just went and hid in the woods that was the only people you know that's what saved me i think i probably would have committed suicide um it, without that because yeah it just felt like there was no one there yeah it was like ah oh, fucked it was yeah such a, a mess so hearing you and your courage and sharing yeah it does trigger well i remember and i think i have to put in some things there's a few things for me in terms of looking at our responses i suppose in the one is i think you're probably a lot further down the path and the journey to connecting back with your emotions and i'll just give you a just a little i suppose evidence of that if you like in the you know i've had a number of significant figures die during my life who i've been immen immensely close to you know we had a friend james who went mm -hmm. to the school um my grandparents who i was incredibly close to and um and my father and i've always found myself on the day trying to or even around the time trying to force myself to cry like I'm, i should cry this is the right thing to do i remember with james i remember thinking right cry this is what you need to do and then i remember thinking oh maybe i'm in the wrong place so i climbed up on the roof of um you know place i was up in london i was like maybe i need some space and and nothing came and the i think the only time my wife has seen me cry was and it just was the bizarrest situation because i never saw it coming is my mum phoned to say that her dog had died. We were driving around Bournemouth near where we live and I couldn't stop crying. I just mm -hmm. could not stop crying. My, my wife was just like terrified. Like, what the hell is going on here? I've never seen this man pretty much barely shed, shed a tear. And um, and I was just hysterically crying about And it wasn't, it's not a dog I was pretty close to. I mean, it was, a you know, and mm -hmm. it felt like something. So I, I think you're much further down the line. And I think the other thing to say, um is that i think for you when you say that you were alone i think you really were mm. um my memories of you are um i think you built a real survival shell i mean you were exceptional sportsman which i think helped uh unbelievably fearless on a rugby pitch you're flying tackles you know really athletic and i think i remember you letting a lot out on the sports pitch mm. uh, watching mm. that um but I think you had been, I think you'd had a number of situations where you perhaps opened yourself up a little bit to try and seek that, you know, some sort of connection, comfort, friendship, kinship, any of those sort of things. And I think you'd been, you'd been rebutted or you'd been, you know, that had been sort of almost, 
I don't know whether mocked the right word is, but it's not, there hadn't been an appropriate response at all. And so I think I could see you just shutting further down, certainly in those those years, you know, those sort of years sort of, you know, from, well, right away from when we started 11 through to, I think it changed a bit around 16. But, um, and I think the final thing is my, and again, I, I think you knew this at the time, but my, I used to get smuggled out of school. Mm. So after that incident with Rick, I mean, it was really, really, you know, would have probably been kicked out. But my dad used to come to the chapel and um, <laughs> ironically uh, being administered over by this chaplain who my dad would meet regularly and talk to and um, would speak very highly of because he was a very erudite guy, mm. intelligent guy, he was erudite. Um, you know, he, he um, you know, he was sort of socially savvy, I suppose. Mm, cocky arrogant i i i feel a little bit cocky yeah definitely mm. but would have no problem charming parents yeah yeah but anyway so and and then he would and then he would basically drive the car to the other side of the railway line and i would dive in through you know hide in the bushes and dive in the back of the car and I'd get to go home and actually that's one of the things that said you know that saved, saved me and we kept obviously we kept that very very quiet i mean it goes to show again Apologies, my uh, ADHD means me are kind of we're, we're meandering a lot, but it speaks, a, it speaks a little bit to the lack of pastoral care or structure because that was on a Sunday and I could go home to the south coast of England. I'd go windsurfing. My dad taught me windsurfing in those Sundays. I could go home, have Sunday roast, and I could be, as long as I was back by roll call, seven o'clock. I did that for a good couple of years and it was no one ever noticed. Um, and that made a big difference in terms of I did feel like I got I'd got an outlet there. But I certainly remember, um, you know, I certainly remember for most people it was, yeah, you just didn't have that. Um, but it was a huge betrayal of trust. So I think, yeah, going back to your original question, <laughs> um, I guess seeing it through the lens of a very unusual event, but a very significant event, um, I, I don't think. I don't think there was that pastoral care, not that I experienced anyway, um, that not not my experience of that. And I think in terms of the safeguarding, um, I think what's come out of that, those multiple arrests and then subsequent um, convictions, mm. are the school failed to act on disclosures. They obstructed, um, uh, you know, kind of testimony. Um, there was some, I think there was some stuff around manipulating the truth as well um kind of some coercive stuff in terms of you know suggest you don't do this because your name will appear you know all of those things that we've read about that have been in the in, in the press mm -hmm. and so obviously i have a huge amount of anger to those individuals most of which i remember very clearly and many of which we all had significant concerns about but there was never a single conversation about well, what do we do about this there just didn't seem to be any there didn't seem to be any options i mean some of them had got nicknames around the kind of their presumed misdemeanors, which mm -hmm. turned out to be surprisingly accurate. We had uh, that in the first couple of weeks, you know, backs the walls, you know. Yeah, he, he yeah, walls. absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, that, um, I think I've got a huge amount of anger towards those individuals, but I also have, I find it hard not to be exceedingly angry with the the, the people who were responsible for safeguarding there because because they fail um at that certainly with that and i think that's that's not a single isolated case that's endemic um within that that school as far as i that would be my perspective and it is just an opinion but that would be my perspective mm -hmm. um and i think the other really disturbing thing is about you know safeguarding there's lots of tenets to safeguarding one of them is about you know putting things in place to protect people in the future mm -hmm. um and then, so then to, and again, I'm just quoting from the pop, from the, um, you know, from the print press uh, reports of around these things, to then send those, some of those individuals on to other schools with a reference um, is, I, I, I don't really have a word for that. Mm. Um, I, I don't really know what to say about that. Uh, it, it, it's just beyond, beyond comprehension, to be honest. Um, and so, yeah, I think 
yeah I, 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 I i'm trying to think of a, an analogy i guess if i was in a situation where i felt that a colleague you know and it happened it does you know unfortunately it happens in all spheres you know um there are safeguarding issues in in all in all spheres um all environments but if i failed to report a colleague who was acting with the level of inappropriateness um then i would expect i'd be struck off mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you it's really powerful in your testimony obviously because i yeah because i can relate to it so much um i realize we've got about five minutes left so time's gone quickly um i can um yeah i might be able to uh, hang on let me just uh i'm meant to be taking someone into the freezing cold sea which is one of my other interests at the moment um i can probably push that back a little bit actually oh i mean it's up to you really um i think i mean you can always come back and and continue this conversation that would be uh would be great as well yeah. don't think okay. if you want to get into the sea uh as well i mean well i can probably i've probably got another half an hour or so yeah yeah half an hour. okay well i guess yeah. for me some of the other bits you know you've shared about your experience as a boarding school you know what about imposter syndrome you know what's what comes up for you? Because I noticed that. I mean, so many of the things you shared, sense of failure. I felt like I was a complete failure. I thought I was a piece of shit. Um, I felt like you said, I'm going to get found out saying me too. People are suddenly going to realize I'm, I'm fucked. I'm not a nice person. Um, and yeah, in reinventing myself, it was like, yeah. I, I remember traveling around uh, Australia and in each place I would be a different person and act. I would act something else. See, rather than just being authentic. So, so many of the things you speak about, I can go, yeah. And you also mentioned captivity. You know, as Joy Sharon says, A, B, C, D. You know, for me, yeah, we were captive. We couldn't get out. And especially those first few years when we were expected to be in the boarding house all the yeah. time yeah you know yeah absolutely and and it was an overwhelming captivity wasn't it i mean it was you know just thinking about that in terms of a, a you know a stimulus rich environment not always in a, in a good way um and you couldn't get away the other things you couldn't get away from your adversaries that's the other challenging thing mm -hmm. um one of the uh one of my traumatic moments there early on which really was isn't massive but uh really struck me as, as as we talked about doing this podcast i was trying to think of things that really sort of you know sprang to mind but um i remember when i first got there my mum had you know uh, we we unpacked didn't we mm -hmm. go into this absolute chaos and and there's so many things isn't there there's you know there's a whole new language to learn you remember you know if you wanted to uh, there was kith slab there was kv i mean there's also the whole new language you had to learn Mm. um Which and i remember one reading, reading uh uh charles spencer's book it's the same stuff he says kv again was in his school it's like yeah. it was across the public schools it felt yeah it felt it felt really chaotic but i remember one early person i really didn't like um and you just couldn't get away from i think that was the difference that's not why I, I hadn't experienced it before but so I we we turned up at the you know we turned up in those early days and we had our bed and we had a little it was almost like a little open cubicle I suppose so um, and the kid opposite me who was the year above he obviously looked at me and thought I don't like the look of this kid I'm going to give him a hard time and my parents had um, unpacked everything and they'd hidden underneath one thing that they hadn't unpacked. And they had hidden underneath some really nice prints and posters of um, some cars, like classic 80s cars, you know, back in the day. And they were really, they were obviously really quite nice. And they'd lit, written a note saying, we're really proud of you. We love you so much. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, why have you bloody sent me away? But, um, you know, so I put the posters up on the wall and they kind of really were, that felt like a sort of link with home, I suppose, a bit like that, that poor guy with the teddy bear. And this guy, I put them up on the first 
I think it was the first or second night, we'd obviously, they'd run out of spoons in the dining hall and we'd got plastic spoons and he brought a couple back and he spent the entire evening coughing up the most disgusting things come from his throat and chest, spitting them into this thing and just flinging kind of these horrible, snotty, spit, you know, things through the sp spoon at my posters. And and I and I it was just it's just that feeling of powerlessness. I was like, I just I've not really come across that before. And, and it felt like you were literally spitting on my parents. This is, you know, felt really as a, I mean it sounds ridiculous now, but as a youngster, it felt really it felt really painful. And I remember just hating this guy for a long time. You just can't get away from them. There's no there's no sort of let up. There's no sense of you can there's no sense that you can get away with. Um and I think, yeah, I think that was you know that was really hard and so then you can't you, it's quite hard then to process any emotions around it mm -hmm. and so you then i think you often internalize them don't you and then you know they can come out in quite negative ways and you know i think you then turn them in on yourself and um and i, I had quite a long period of time when i was younger where when i'd get frustrated i would um i would find things that were really precious to me and i would i would find quite a perverse pleasure in breaking them and that felt like the best way to release I, I hated confrontation found confrontation quite hard and so it, it felt like it internalized um and you know in, that's quite a self-destructive way and I, i'd like take my favorite toy and i'd just slowly break it apart and i knew i'd feel real and i sort of knew that i'd feel real upset about that later on but that was almost part of the sort of that's good i deserve it kind of thing um so yeah i think i think they're absolutely captivity um and, and that led to all sorts of problems mm, thank you thank you the other thing we mentioned about when we spoke a few weeks ago was four cruxes and harry potter and yeah Dublin. and you said you know, yeah i'd love you to speak a bit about that because i found reading harry potter in my 20s it was traumatic because especially the book book four when um cedric diggory dies I was just in tears for the last 150 pages because it was just like, wow, because I was starting to wake up to my tears. And, you know, obviously, I'd love you to speak a bit. What do you see the link between boarding school, Voldemort, Horcruxes and that splitting? Yeah. Yeah, it was something I, I was just thinking about the other day and it just came to my mind when we were talking. And I think this is when we were talking. I think this is really around the question about um i suppose the impacts of boarding school isn't it what what it's done and there what there was a question um around that i i think before i'll answer that i just want to i know there was another question we were going to talk about and you asked me in one word how would you sum up your uh feelings about boarding school yeah, yeah. um and i thought about that like quite a lot and i just kind of <laughs> feel like i'm going to slightly i want to provide a little bit of balance i'm just aware i've been perhaps a little negative um, and I think the only the thing I could think of was complicated were my feelings about it, really complicated, because we've talked about some of the negative stuff here. But I think what's difficult is some of my I have some real moments and memories of beauty from that school. I mean, as we got older and more established, it was un, undeniably a beautiful place, particularly in summer. And there was and there was there was it was clearly aspirational as well, wasn't it? And you were exposed to things that were you may not otherwise have have, have seen um uh you know i think about some of the cultural artistic the theater i remember the theater just being going to the theater and that just feeling so exciting to have that um uh and yeah being out playing cricket on the grounds in the summer i mean it was romantically wonderfully beautiful moments um and that kind of all of that sort of teenage angst and emotion and you know that that uh, I can't remember who who did you know teenage dreams so hard to beat, but it really felt like you're in an environment where, you know, certainly for me it was it felt like quite a romantic environment. Uh, I don't mean that in I just mean in terms of like classically romantic rather than you know I had lots of girlfriends which I absolutely did not. <laughs> um, so I think that I and and then some experiences. I mean, some of our trips away with the school were some of the funniest things, and and again some situations where you felt in you did feel you know real sense of bonding with your your peers and um moments of levity and fun and it was just an environment of extremes i, I felt you know extreme despair at times but 
you know, there were times when I did genuinely feel really happy, particularly as I got older. Um, so I think that's hard, you know, it's hard sort of trying to reconcile that a little bit because it's it's like anything in life, isn't it? You know, it's life's not binary. It's, you know, there were definitely some good aspects. So I think I just wanted to get that in. But Ooh, no, I think I think the um I think the stuff in terms of four crutches and adults, and and it's really only been since you know probably over the last ten years with various people about it, this. I've thought more about about this. Is what what were the impacts? Because it was such an extraordinary experience just to be dropped there at eleven, and then not really be in your own sleeping in your own bed for at least six weeks. You know, you had a couple of hours at home after three weeks. And I remember being prized out of cupboards. You know, so it wasn't. It you know it clearly had an impact. For a long time, I think I didn't. I didn't feel like it did have anything actually. Um, as I said, I then went into another in, sort of, you know, kind of organisation medicine, which felt quite comfortable. Um, it just felt great, and like, in many ways, life felt easy. And I remember going to medical school, seeing people who were homesick, and I just could not relate. I couldn't understand. Yeah, you know, how are you homesick at eighteen and nineteen? It just felt amazing. It felt like total sort of freedom. Um, but I think as I've got older, uh, so I think the tw my twenties felt really quite nice. I think. What has I? I guess you get more honest as you get older in a way, don't you? You just try and really, and you get happier trying to critique and understand yourself. But I think I began to be aware that I'm living, you know, I've lived multiple lives, or it feels like you live multiple lives and quite effortlessly. And as you talk about, you know, you become, you know, there was that reinvention and then, but then becoming quite different things, quite convincingly different in different spheres the point where i always remember thinking if i had a party where i ever knew everyone it would be the most stressful event ever it would be the stress most stressful event because mm -hmm. i couldn't do all of those things at once they were these sort of discreet non-connecting kind of lives that you li lived and i think there was a sort of protectiveness about that in a way because you could slip into one if one wasn't working so well mm -hmm. and this extreme um compartmentalization which which began to be increasingly um increasingly evident to me disability i mean i feel like i'm like to think i'm fairly emotionally aware and all the rest of it but i know that I, I can you know you can feel the shutters go down and i began to see it in a few of my friends um and began to see it as significant life events so you know like i've, I've talked about you know death um just finding that really strange like why am i not responding then also finding it quite valuable in some aspects of my job. So, the, you know, we have some situations which are really, um, you know, emotionally very stressful resuscitations, you know, parents, you know, incredibly distressed and all the rest of it. Uh, sometimes you're having to do practical procedures in the middle of all of this. And I remember, you know, and really still to this day, the ability to really tune that out very powerfully mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that feeling like a real benefit. And for a long time, really only just seeing... I suppose seeing seeing the benefits of it really. Um, I, another, I suppose, another significant event was when I um, uh, split up with my long term partner, um, and you know I know I loved her dearly, but um, I remember when we split up. I remember thinking this is strange. This is, it was the longest relationship I'd ever had, and I remember thinking it's strange how easy it is. I remember going out for a meal that evening, and just thinking. Well, it's not meant to be like this, I don't think, but I don't, I don't feel anything. Um, and it was a long, long time before. And, and that makes you feel a bit invincible, to be honest. It's very, very, um, very beguiling, actually. You, you just think, gosh, I can somehow ride above some of this stuff. This is not that I wanted anything. You know, she was a lovely girl. I didn't want anything bad to her, but it sort of felt like this is so... It almost feels like you've got a cheat code or something in a game. You know, you're just like, how how can I how can I kind of do this? Um, but it, it was a long time later coming out, and then much so for, for that particular event. And I saw it in my friends as well. I saw it in some of my friends who think not not yourself, but um, one particular very close friend who would have that. He would have these long term relationships. He would de dearly love these girls, and then it would like a switch, and he would make a decision, and there would be nothing. There would be no emotional. You know, he wouldn't be affected by any emotional personal emotional fallout himself mm -hmm. so it felt yeah it felt quite um you know it felt really quite powerful and i think i think it's much later beyond that that you feel like that there is a cost to this splitting essentially mm -hmm. and 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 it reminded me we were talking about you know in order to survive i think i'm not i'm not a massive harry potter fan i've read the books and seen the movies a while ago but 
I think there was a bit where, in order to survive, he splits his personality into Horcruxes, doesn't he? So, um, and again, I, I might not be quite right on this, but I think it was that's to allow him to survive. Um, but there was a cost to that. So, A, he had to have gone through something pretty horrendous to have done that. And then, um, and then I think he could never live a true authentic life um, because of that. And I think that's, um, I think that's, what if that's what it feels like even to this day i think that's where i can see um i can see the real problems that you you know if i'm being really honest with myself it's it's about controlling what it's about controlling the message and what you give to someone um and you just become so mar you get such mastery over it mm -hmm. the only thing is it will take you so far it will only take you so far so it feels like um you could um i wrote it down earlier because i remember it just feeling like it um made sense to me i'll see if i can i'll see if i can find it um it feel um where are we i'll have to find it in a minute um essentially it feels like you can kind of um fit in anywhere but not belong mm. so it felt like you got you you got the ability to you know shape shift quite comfortably and invent new shapes and what have you hmm. um but you could you'd only get so far and that, and that would be the same with relationships but also yeah that feeling of um of being completely yeah living a complete true self and i know and i know i've lived part you know little lives that people really are very unaware of significant parts of my life um and i think that it that takes real energy to do that it starts off effortless, fairly effortless, felt fairly effortless, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure why it find, it seems harder to get older, but it feels harder. It feels like it takes more energy. And then it starts breaking down a bit. And then I had an experience at work where I, I found it really hard to switch off. And that really shook me. I, I, I felt like something had gone. I'd lost, <laughs> lost something really significant. Um, that really worried me. And I, I can sort of, I think it's, having my own children has felt has challenged that as well um and but trying to then re build that together is is quite hard because i think sometimes what you do is you inhabit certain things to to get away from aspects of yourself that you feel really uncomfortable talking about you feel really uncomfortable with so you sort of invent something that you can go and inhabit for a while because you don't have to face face that and it, it feels like there's that reckoning that I'm approaching, I suppose, um, mm. and and it feels it feels worrying, really. Um, mm. But I think what feels inevitable is that I don't think you can inevitably keep these pieces apart if you want to carry on surviving. And that's sort of where I feel like I'm at, at the moment, which is you know it's a bit of a pivot point, really. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I remember my reawakening it was yeah in my 20s and yeah I, I think i'd love to just you know i've said this to you before but it really comes to me is you know in london when i started to have my breakdown i split up from my long-term partner you know you took me in and i i don't think i really would be here alive if you hadn't been there to support me at really difficult times so i really you know bless you will for your uh, your support your friendship your love over the years and um yeah it's meant a lot to me and yeah so so thank you well likewise peers yeah yeah no um it's hard talking about these things and uh but it's much easier talking to someone who is as open as you are and i think you um you're in many ways you're carving a path for some of us who haven't had the quite had the bravery to take those steps so i think you know i think that what i see with you is is you, yeah you're that sort of pathfinder and you know it's much easier following someone so i you know for those of us in in this situation i would definitely thank you for that very important work thank you thank you yeah i, I didn't want to be a path i didn't want to yeah as you know i try to take my own life a few times so uh when i was living in london and uh and after so i certainly yeah wasn't my intention to do this my intention was to to run away and uh but i i couldn't 
I couldn't do it. One of one of my other my final point would be that my, I suppose just my own experience of this and this sort of compartmentalizing and this mastery of emotions is that I wanted to say that it feels like it is intensified around times of stress. Mm-hmm. So when you are pressure tested or you're and sometimes that works well, like I say, resuscitation or something like that. But I think you can see where that breaks down when you are being pressure tested in a relationship when actually what you really need is emotional information to make decisions. Mm. And actually you, I think those behaviors are really magnified at that point. That's what I find. I can feel myself just, you know, boxing in. And I think, you know, you can escalate that to whatever level you want. You can imagine some of our leaders who perhaps have been in a similar situation and you get a sense of that, you know, they're being pressure tested all the time. You get a sense of, you know, the, the, that level of stress. Um, and I just wonder whether actually that's that's when you actually inhabit, you go back, you revert to, um, you know, you revert to that. Um, I think so, definitely. I think the unconscious, we just, when we're in that stress, we go back and the unconscious programs are running. As Jung said, psychological rule states that when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside of space. That's what I see with a lot of our leaders who've been to boarding school. Pressure, they just flip back into that child self, that seven or eight year old with David Cameron or um, yeah. Junak or Jeremy Hunt. And, and it's it's helpful to understand because it, it can sometimes be a bit confusing, particularly at a personal level. But also when you watch other people, you think, well, how can you be like this in this situation? How can you be so kind and compassionate? Mm-hmm. But it's because the situation, you know, I think it's probably because of the situation. It's not it's not a, you know, it's 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 not you under pressure or you under threat. Um, and I think that's where the problems the, the problems come. And so you've got to you've got to get to the point where you can deal with that stuff without reverting to those sort of um those strategies i guess mm, yeah yeah so i'm aware time wise we're kind of coming up to the half hour any l- final things you'd love to to share will that you were like oh, i really wanted to say this but <laughs> no i don't think so i'm aware that i'm pretty rambling meandering so i apologize for that um Not at all. um no, I um no, I think it's yeah, it's just a com- it's a complex topic, isn't it? And I think it's I think it's valuable for people to just have a little think about. You know, it was it was kind of eye opening for me, and you know, definitely a bit of a work in progress. But I think it I think it's not to be dismissed the that impact of a sudden wrenching from from safety and um and it kind of gets hidden amongst jokes and laughing about some of the stuff, but. Yeah, as I say, as a paediatrician, I, I, you know, that's, you know, that's a very young age, isn't it? You know, it's just mm-hmm. there. And so I think it's it's worth just just acknowledging that and, you know, just having a think about how that may have affected you. Mm, yeah, bless you. Well, thank you, Will. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And uh, yeah, I recommend people kind of go and do his chill down in Dorset or um, I put kind of links to parent med as well uh in the in the description so guys you know please go and um, join up but thank you will thanks Piers. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.